You're listening to The Nobody Zone, a podcast in six parts brought to you by RTE Documentary on One in Ireland and Thirdia Productions in Denmark. My name's Tim Hinman. This is episode four of The Nobody Zone, so you'll need to hear episodes one to three before you hear this one, if you haven't heard them already. Before we get back to the story of Kieran Patrick Kelly, here's a scene for you. Away from a dimly lit street with dingy yellow streetlights, just down the road from Tooting Broadway Station in southwest London, you'll find a tall, imposing church, St. Nicholas Church. It's surrounded by an old graveyard that's been a resting place for the dead since long before the city came and surrounded it. Tonight, an August night in 1982, there's a shady figure moving around in the darkness. He's busy popping pills out of their foil and plastic packet into a cup. He's mashing them up. When he's done, he mixes up the powder with some surgical spirits until the pills dissolve. Then he adds orange juice and shakes the whole mixture up, pouring it back into the bottle. He moves off to where another man, a drunk, homeless man, is propped up against one of the low, flat gravestones in the graveyard, and he offers him a drink from the bottle. The drunken man here is called Mickey Dunn. Of course, the man with the pills and the surgical spirit is our man, Kieran Patrick Kelly, called Nosy Kelly on the streets around here. A small, wiry man with a big nose and intense, dark eyes. But when Kelly arrives and offers Dunn the bottle, it's a sort of peace offering between two drunks. Two dossers with nothing better to do, nowhere else to go. They sit together, and Kelly watches as Dunn drinks the whole bottle and then falls asleep. Kelly drinks from a different bottle. When Dunn finally falls unconscious, Kelly takes the bottle from him, moves off into the night, and throws the bottle into a bin somewhere, making sure to smash it. A few days later, Mickey Dunn is dead. Are you ready now? Did you know that the stuff that you were giving Mickey Dunn was going to kill him then? Or did you hope it would? You hoped that it would. I hoped it would. I killed him so. It didn't kill him there and then. Who did he murder or are you a spy? And just under the drink helps me laugh, helps me cry. No, but just drink red biddy for a permanent high. I laugh a lot less. I cry till I die oh, I'm so By the end of the previous episode, we'd found out that Kieran Patrick Kelly was most likely not the London underground serial killer, as described in a book by Jeff Platt. Kelly did admit to pushing two, maybe three people in front of trains on the underground, but only one of these victims died. We also found out that it's very unlikely that Kelly killed 31 people and that he admitted this to Jeff Platt. So we're left with the 13, 14 or 15 victims he did confess to killing on tape to the police. One dependable thing we do have is a taped interview with Kelly confessing to multiple murders. Maybe that's where we should be looking if we want to find the truth. What we're both after is the truth. Yeah, you got the truth as far as I'm concerned. We have. Uh, do you mind if we go through it just a few points again? Well, that's, that's the points. OK, fair that's enough. <laughs> this is that audio tape again. On the tape is the then Detective Inspector Ian Brown and his superior officer, Chief Superintendent Ray Adams. Identify yourself, sir. Detective Chief Superintendent Adams in the presence of Detective Inspector Brown. I'm going to start by looking at just three of the murder cases that connect to Kieran Patrick Kelly. One for which he was tried in court and found not guilty. One which he was tried in court and found guilty of, 
and one that he got away with without ever being charged. And I'm going to start with that one because that is the case of Mickey Dunn. Now, Mickey Dunn, you told us you met him in the churchyard at Tooting, was it? I was in the churchyard in Tillsmouth, yeah. And you, well, what did you do to him? I gave him a drink. You gave him a drink? I gave him a few quarters as well. How much did you give him? One of the large bottles. What, what tablets did you put in it? I put uh, Dexedin and I put um, other ones out of the just, just out of the chemist. Some tablets you got out of the chemist? Yeah. Do you remember what they were? No. I shook them up, put them into the yeah. uh, orange juice. That's what happened right at the start of this episode. Kieran Kelly deliberately poisoning Mickey Dunn using a mix of surgical spirits, dexedrine pills, that's a kind of amphetamine, and some pills he stole from the chemist at Tooting. How did you know I'd kill him? Huh? How did you know I'd kill him? Because I, I asked people. Who did you ask? I asked people and talk about murders and you read it in books and papers, poison them, they go into chemists, get special stuff. Kelly says he found out how to poison Dunn by asking around, reading books and reading newspapers. Did you know that the stuff that you were giving Mickey Dunn was going to kill him then? Or did you hope it would? You hoped that it would. Yeah, I hoped it would. So I killed him slowly. Didn't kill him there and then. Kelly says he didn't kill Dunn there and then. He killed him slowly. I have Mickey Dunn's death certificate here. He died in hospital on August 28th, 1982. He had no home address, no occupation. He no, he no home one, a regular one, like one for every night. Uh, His date and place of birth are unknown. It just says 1937, no exact date. As a victim of Kieran Kelly, Mickey Dunn will tick all the boxes. He's homeless, he's an alcoholic, and he's not going to be missed by anyone. When did you hear that he, he died? Kelly didn't actually see Mickey Dunn die. In fact, Kelly was unsure exactly how long after he says he poisoned him that Dunn checked himself into a hospital. I was with him. I drank with him after that. What, that night? No, a couple of days after I, I drank with him. A couple of days after? Yeah, and he's very started spelling out. He started complaining with bad pains. At the hospital, the doctors believed him to be dying of, well, just the sort of thing that homeless, meth-drinking, alcoholic substance abusers usually die of. And Dunn didn't know he'd been poisoned, even if he might have suspected that Kelly had it in for him. He knew what he was after him. That's the strange way of saying it. So what was the motive? Mickey Dunn. That's the same Mickey Dunn that gave evidence against you in that other murder, isn't it? The toll murder? Yeah. And why, why, why did you do that to him? Because he told fucking lies at the Old Bailey. He made a statement down in Kennington, lies. Well, they nearly convicted you of a murder? Yeah. And so you did him? Yeah. So, the motive here is a grudge. Mickey Dunn had testified against Kelly in another court case. And that's the second case I wanted to talk about. The one Kelly was tried for and acquitted of. Mickey Dunn that gave evidence against you in that other murder, isn't it? The toll murder? Yeah. Kelly was on trial and he was found not guilty for the murder of another homeless alcoholic man, also murdered in a churchyard, this time over in nearby Kennington in South London. This was the murder of Edward Toll. Ian Brown has long since retired from the police, but here he is recently, recalling the case of Edward Toll. Kelly had gone over to a tramp who was sleeping on a tombstone. And that was where Kelly used to sleep, and he wasn't very pleased that this other tramp was sleeping there. So he'd taken a rope from around his trousers, which kept his trousers up, put it round the other tramp's neck, and pulled it tight. As he walked away, another tramp said to him, oh, you might have killed him, Kelly. And he went back, put it round again, and pulled it again and said, I have now. The crime described here fits Kelly's style perfectly. 
killing someone brutally for getting in his way, in this case just for sleeping in his spot. Not so far removed from his reason for killing William Boyd in the cells at Clapham. If you remember, he also strangled Boyd because he was snoring too loud. But Kelly was found not guilty of the killing of Ed Toll in spite of two witnesses who said they saw him do it. By the time the murder trial comes, Kelly has been inside for six months. He's smart, he's off, off the wine and the spirits. Uh, and to all, all intents and purposes, he looks normal. So he stands up in the box and pleads his innocence. And the only evidence against him were two tramps, who were both still tramps, still alcoholics, still on meths, and their evidence was really just not credible. So as a result of that, Kelly walked out. Kelly walked out. And a few years down the line, he catches up with one of the two unreliable witnesses, Mickey Dunn, and he gets his revenge. Sammy Scott was the same. The other witness, Sammy Scott, had already died in the meantime while Kelly was in prison for something else. Who? Sam, <clears throat> Sammy Scott. Did you try to do him, man? He's dead. He died. Did you do him? No, I was in Wandsworth. I was in Wandsworth then. All right. Couldn't get to him until Kelly, yeah? Ian Brown is joking around with Kelly here when he says he couldn't get to Sammy Scott in time. But it's an important fact that Kelly was very often in prison for something or other, usually for theft, shoplifting, things like that. Kelly's prison record will turn out to have an important bearing on the whole Kelly timeline. But for now, let's move on to the third case, one Kelly was convicted for, the murder of Hector Fisher. All right, I want to go to move on now and talk about Fisher. Would you tell me again how you did him? I did my, I did my wallop, and I, don't, I, I cut him. I, I don't think there were stamps. I'm not sure. But I cut his bulks. But... How many times did you stab him? I don't know. I was um, I had a good drink on me. And what did you hit him on the head with? With a, with a, with a fucking big thing you had in your hand. A big thing you had in your hand? The, the hand of the big blade. Big, the handle of the big blade. It wasn't heavy, it was a heavy. The tape's a bit hard to hear here, but Kelly is saying something like he hit him with the handle of a big blade, something heavy. Then he says that he hurt his own hand when he hit him a second time. How many times did you hit him on the head? I hit him once and then I hit him again, but I missed him. I hurt me on hand the second time. Where did you meet him that night? He was coming, coming, coming around from the chip shop. Fisher wasn't a dosser like Kelly. However, he was an alcoholic and he was on his way down. Lately, he'd been spending time drinking on the common with people like Kieran Kelly. Was he a friend of yours, huh? He was a, he was a friend of the Dustin's around there. Kelly knew about things that matched evidence from the scene. Things Ian Brown says he could only have known about if he'd been there. And he said, I was too clever for you. You didn't realise it was a robbery. I said, no, you're far too clever, Kelly. He said, uh, I covered it up. And I said, and how did you do that? He said, uh, well, he had a lot of money in his pocket but I left 40 pounds in his pocket so you wouldn't know he'd been robbed. So we get all the papers out and find that when the pathologist went to the scene, he took two 20 pound notes, 40 pounds, out of the pocket, which is pretty good confirmation that Kelly knew what he was talking about. Ask him why he did it and he said, he wanted my ass, so I stabbed him, and I stabbed him in the bollocks. Fisher was known to wear women's clothing sometimes. Kelly described him, and these are Kelly's words here, not mine, as a puff and a dirty bastard. So it's confusing when Kelly says it was just a robbery, and when he also says it was because Fisher wanted his ass. But Kelly is nearly always confusing. Brown and Adams have a job to do just trying to get the facts in the right order. 
Well, tell us what happened from there. You met him? He went in, into, into, the, into the church from the back end. He went in, he sat down. The chain of events in this whole case are typical for Kelly. To begin with, Kelly is offended by something or other Fisher says or does, and then he loses it. He beats and stabs Fisher in a brutal rage while he's drunk, or steamed up, as Kelly puts it. But maybe the most typical thing for Kelly here is that he leaves the scene before knowing if his victim is actually dead. And how was he when you left him? Huh? How was he when you left him? I didn't know when he was dead. Or alive, no, I wasn't worrying. I was half steamed up and I wasn't worrying. So I met a bit across and I turned away the gear in the, in the skips, back into the skipper. Another typical Kelly trait is that he was found hanging around nearby after the crime. I came out the next morning and he was stopped two times by uniformed police right next to the murder scene the day after. I got pulled by you, Lan, because they had the tapes in all up. Had the tapes up? Mm. Or the white tape? Yeah. Round the, yeah. Round the where, they, where he was? Had a, yeah. Were there many people there, then? There was enough of you that day. Yeah. He was still wearing the clothes he'd been wearing when he'd killed Fisher the night before and he had blood stains on his jumper. I, I had a fucking jumper and I had blood on it, and I didn't think I had so much blood on it till the next morning. But you had his blood on you, on your jumper? Yeah. What jumper was that? Spatter red blood. Huh? What jumper was it? Red one. Nobody spotted the blood on his red jumper, but later that day, after the police had run a quick check on Kelly's name, they tracked him down a third time he was drinking nearby. They decided to pull him into the police station for questioning. But by that time, Kelly'd had time to change his clothes and he was ready to deny everything. I said, fuck you. You loved that. It was in the car. I said, oh. I said, I know fucking nothing. And that's what you kept stuck to, is it? Yeah. All the way through. Kelly was just another tramp to the police. Invisible. A nobody. So they let him go. It would be eight years before Kelly would finally be convicted for murdering Hector Fisher. I mean, people listening might find it unusual that somebody commits a serious crime, gets away with it to the extent that they're not under investigation for it, but then to offer up information on those crimes willingly. Here's journalist Robert Mulhern again. He's back. He's talking to Ian Brown about what he can remember from talking to Kelly. Was, it, was the case unusual in that respect? Very, very unusual, uh, especially as uh, I think he did it because he'd got away with it and he wanted to show us that he was cleverer than us. And in actual fact, those were the first, virtually the first words that came out of his mouth. I was too clever for you, the actual words that Kelly spoke. The actual words of Kieran Patrick Kelly. But was Kelly really so clever? Was that how he got away with so many murders, or was it down to something else? Ian Brown is no psychiatrist, but he's met enough criminal minds in his time to make a qualified character assessment. So what is Ian Brown's opinion of Kelly, the man? How would you describe him? A nutter. <laughs> you can use all the medical terms you want, but he was somebody who was mentally unstable, when he was sober, which wasn't very often, uh, and was even more mentally unstable when he was drunk, which was most of the time. What about IQ? Above average, below average? No, I would say well below average, well below average. I think if you check back on his rec record, you won't find many A-levels. Being unintelligent is not a defence for any crime although being insane can be. But if we consider the three cases we just heard about, they demonstrate quite clearly that when Kelly chose to kill, he did so with intent. He could plan ahead, he could cover his tracks, and he could claim innocence when questioned, even hold his head up all the way through a court case. Kelly was not considered insane before the law, but 
Ian Brown recalls that Kelly had once been given a sentence under the Mental Health Act for a violent crime dating all the way back to the late 1960s. As far back as 1969, Kelly committed a robbery in South East London where him and another guy went to a house. Uh, they banged on the door, a woman answered the door, they rushed in with knives, they tied her up, threatened her and robbed her. Kelly was arrested, taken to the Old Bailey, and he was detained under the Mental Health Act. In actual fact, he went to Broadmoor, uh, which, as you know, is a home for the criminally insane, and he stayed there for two years. Uh, I understand they couldn't do much with him and released him. So Kelly had been sent to Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital and let out after two years, back in 1971. Looking at Kelly's timeline for the murders he confessed to, that's interesting. Because even though he started way back in 1953 by killing his best friend, Christy Smith, the next murder doesn't happen until 1973. That's two years after he gets out of Broadmoor. When Kelly made his confessions to Ian Brown, he claimed that three murders took place in 1973. All homeless men, all beaten or stabbed to death. That's the man I done, but I didn't know who he was. But here's the thing, he's not 100% sure who any of these people were, and he didn't hang around to make sure they were dead after it attacked them. Talk to them, they're dead. I don't have to, I'm not, I don't worry, I can't help, sneak out. So, so and you never know whether they're dead or not? No, no that's why I don't worry. He doesn't know who they were, he didn't see them die, and what's more, he doesn't worry about it. It's confusing. This is the next important thing we really have to understand about the whole Kelly case. The confusion. Right. I see. What you're saying to us is you did pour whiskey down someone's yeah. throat and you did kill him, but you've heard about this one in Coronation Building and you're saying that might, you've connected the two up. Kelly's confused, Ian Brown is confused, everyone is confused by Kelly's testimony. The confusion here is about the killing of a man by forcing whiskey down his throat. It happened in a derelict building in Vauxhall, South London, called Coronation Building. Well, let's put it to you bluntly. I don't get the right. Well, what he, said, what he just said is that what, what happened was you did a guy. Yeah. You then went in prison. Yeah. And months later, somebody said to you, oh, that guy died in Coronation Building. Yeah, and we were all pulled in. And we were all pulled in. Yeah. And you said to yourself, Christ, that's, that's the one I did. Right, yeah. Yeah? But it might not be. It might not be. It might not be, says Kelly. Then Kelly has trouble recognising a photograph he'd positively identified the day before as the man he'd killed. Do you remember yesterday afternoon, I came down to the cell yeah. and I showed you a photograph? Yeah? Yes. Right, now, have another look at it. I looked at it. Yeah, well, have one more. I can see it now, sir. That's a photograph there. Now, who do you think that might be? I don't know. Well, do you know it? Do you know who he is? Well, no, you tell us, Kelly, who is he? I don't know. (laughs) Well, have you ever seen him before? Yeah. Where do you think? Sorry. Well, I was going to say, let's put it to you, Bunton, you mean. Is that the guy you killed? In Coronation Building. He's fucking like you, mate, I'll be honest. Kelly's unsure if it's the right man, but he remembers, in graphic detail, exactly how he killed him. He made him choke to death by holding his head and pouring whiskey down his throat. And how did you do him? Uh, <coughs> the way you described to me that you, you, you killed him... Yeah. Before, when you remember, you got down on your knees yeah. in this office, yeah. and you showed me with the towel, yeah. okay. and you had that under his chin, and you you had his head between your knees, yeah, so you were pulling it back. the other chin to his ears. My knees was holding it, the towel to his ears. Yes. Did you show him there? You're pulling down on his chin yeah. to open his mouth. I didn't grab him. I didn't scrape him. I grabbed no. him. No. You're all right. You're on. And I got it in and kept doing it. He kept bobbing it. And he was bringing back up. So what you're showing me there is you, you've opened his... Yeah. You pushed his chin over, down and down, opened it, yeah. pushing it away from you, yeah. and you poured the whiskey in. Yeah. Out of a bottle? Yeah, out of a bottle, yeah. 
The police found a homeless man who had died in a way that fits what Kelly described. He choked to death. But Kelly's unsure about the exact date at which the murder took place, as he'd done some prison time that year. Jesus, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know. Very important, Kelly, this one. No, honestly, if you get me to put a thousand pound there, I, 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 I just cannot tell you, yes, I know. I cannot say yes, I know. You can't say whether it was before or Before or after. Kelly, who was used to going to prison, calls his prison time bird. So you see me record, I'm in and out there. Boy. I can't remember the fuck. All them, all them dates, I go in, the dates have come out. No, I'm really. interested in the dates. I go in and do the bit of board and then I come out and that's it. The dead man the police had identified was called Patsy Walters. And Kelly has agreed that he was the victim. But the problem is that the police know that Kelly was in prison at the time Patsy Walters died. But you were in prison when Patsy Walters died. And then that's not the same one. But you, you see, you're playing a game with us, Kelly. Not you're not laughing again. Playing you're playing a game, that's it. Right. I, I could go meet a fella and he could turn around and say, I'm Patsy Walters, and I'd fucking kill him. Kelly couldn't have killed Patsy Walters. It must have been someone else. Come on, tell us the truth, Kelly. Fine. Come on. Yeah, that's it, I'm telling you. Patsy Walters, come on, tell us the no. truth. Who's that photograph, Kelly? I don't know. Who's the photograph? <laughs> Kelly, it's Patsy Walters, isn't it? It's a bad photograph. Yeah. Okay? It's come a... on, tell us the truth it's about that Pat... one. It's not. Because that's the only one... Kelly was in an under a fucking different name. Yeah, that's not Patsy Walters. What? Right? With no date, with no outstanding murders on the books for the police, who is Kelly admitting to killing? Well then, I don't know when it was that man or not. No. I'm not, I'm not you, sure. You, there's been wrong. some man in coronation yes. buildings, yes. you yes. poured whiskey down his yeah. throat when you're holding his head holding between his your head knees with a bit of cloth around his throat yeah. and he was vomiting. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're This kind of confused dialogue now. fills most of this tape. But you, you, you thought that we were talking about the one that died, but it may not have been the one that died. It may not have been, I'm not sure. It must be, it might be us getting, putting the wrong one to you. No, no, you put, you, you. Kelly's confessions are a mess. He might not know the detail, but at least he seems convinced about the facts. The fact that he did kill all these people. I'm serious about I'm serious, but uh, if not, scru uh, scrub it off. But there's a problem here too. A problem with the facts. Kelly, okay, have you see. done anything else you want to tell us about? I forget now, honestly. Is there that many, Kelly? There is, boss, but it's, I'm, I'm doing them. My brain is uh, just been murdered. I don't murder, I don't mean murdered, but murdered. But by alcohol? Yeah. Kieran Kelly says himself that his brain is what he calls mithered. It's messed up. It's destroyed by alcohol. It's obvious, listening to him, that he's confused even about his own story, let alone details like times, dates, names and locations. And that, of course, is the biggest problem with Kelly's confessions. Facts like times, dates, names and locations. Is there anything else you want to tell us you've done? Look, I, 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 I don't, I just don't fucking know, I'll be honest. Those cases we looked at earlier on, Edward Toll, Mickey Dunn and Hector Fisher, I've got all three of the death certificates relating to those cases here, and I think they're worth a look because there's some confusion here too. It has to do with what's written under the section cause of death. We can look quickly at Edward Toll first, that's the simplest. Edward Toll of no fixed abode died due to strangulation with a ligature. He died on 31st of May 1977, pretty straightforward. We know he was murdered and we know that he was strangled with a rope that was used to hold up a pair of trousers. Kelly was found not guilty of course, in spite of Mickey Dunn testifying against him. Kelly confessed to killing Mickey Dunn of course, with the poisoned drink. Mickey Dunn died on the 28th of August, 1982. Cause of death on Dunn's death certificate is given as bronchial pneumonia and cryptogenic cirrhosis of the liver. Now we've had an expert, a professor of hepatology and gastroenterology at Trinity College Dublin, that's a liver specialist to you and me, to look at this certificate. I can tell you that her conclusion is 
that the symptoms and the cause of death described here are not likely to have been caused by the kind of poisoning Kelly described. This expert would not put Dunn's death down to poisoning with surgical spirit and other drugs. This means that Kelly may not have killed Mickey Dunn after all, even if he had wanted to, even if he thought he had. Kelly himself says he saw him alive after he poisoned him and he wasn't exactly sure about when he died. I drank very much after that. What, that night? No, a couple of days after I, I drank very A couple of days after? Yeah, and he really started swelling out. He started complaining with bad pains. So, Hector Fisher. I have Hector Fisher's death certificate here. He died 19th of July, 1975. Cause of death, stab wounds to the neck and chest. Note, Hector Fisher was not stabbed in the bollocks, as Kelly says he was. I gave him a wallop, and I, I, I cut him. I, I don't think there were stabs. I'm not sure, but I cut his bollocks. Kelly denied killing Fisher in court. He pleaded not guilty. When the judge was directing the jury at the end of the trial, he said this, the $64,000 question is, were the confessions true? And the jury had its doubts. The fact that Fisher was not stabbed in the bollocks and that he'd retracted his confession nearly got Kelly acquitted. In the end, the jury came back with a majority verdict and they found him guilty of murder. But is there a chance that Kelly's confessions simply weren't true? Could he have been claiming things he hadn't done? Oh. Let me put something to you. Ah. Is there any chance that you've been telling us any lies in the hope that we're going to go off chasing red herrings and try and somehow or other you'll rig out of killing that man in the cell? Could Kelly really be just giving them red herrings? Is Kelly being clever? It's up to you, then. Are you trying to wriggle out I'm and killing that man in the cell? You three words, you take mine, or then we scoop the whole lot. This no. one but you here. killed the man in the cell here, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, says Kelly. He admits to killing the man in the cells. I don't think he's telling lies. In the end, neither did the police. Here's Rob Mulhern and Ian Brown again. In the absence of, say, hard evidence, would you still be comfortable in Kelly being described? as a serial killer. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Kelly, the admissions that Kelly made were, that we could trace, were exactly as Kelly said. Uh, the murders are almost definitely correct. Kelly was the murderer and was proud of it. How many murders can we say with a certain degree of confidence that he may have committed? I think, having spent hours and hours with Kelly and watched his bravado, uh, watched his willingness to talk about everything he'd done, I honestly believe Kelly stood up and told us about 12, 13, maybe 14 murders. And I honestly believe if there'd have been 20, he'd have said it. That's my professional opinion. Nobody's ever completely right. But I feel that Kelly most probably did 13, 14, maybe even 15 murders. Uh, was he a serial killer? Yeah. A serial killer is somebody who kills in the same method. And Kelly did. He strangled and stabbed and killed tramps. That makes him a serial killer. Here's one last bit of Kelly chaos to add to his confessions. It comes from the very end of this audio tape. Kelly, well, it's 20 past five. We might as well go and have a cup of tea. I won't be able to ring now, boss. The ring? Not yet, Kelly. Oh, not, not yet. At the no, right no, time. No, at no, the right time. Nobody's promised you'll have to ring right back. Time. If you cast your mind back to the very start, the day Kelly got arrested, you might remember that he wasn't arrested for murdering anyone. He was arrested on Clapham Common for stealing a man's watch and his wedding ring. 
It's got no, to be at the right on, time. Hold on, listen. Look, I got pulled in over the ring. Two has got pulled in over the ring, right? Yes. That's McManus and myself, right? There's nothing about it, right? Now, he wants to get the ring back. Look, they wouldn't let you have the ring back in prison anyway at a moment. Of course they will. It's in your property, Kelly. Then you're allowed to wear your ring and... and, and Can we and, talk about it with your solicitor when we go back to court? It's an well, well, exhibit as to why you got arrested. I mean, you were arrested over the ring, weren't you? No. That's all, what you yeah. were arrested for originally. Yeah. Right. So the ring is an exhibit... Having drawn a line under all those confessions, all right. he really thinks he deserves to get that ring back. Well, then I'm not guilty to the whole lot. All right. That's it. I'm not guilty to this one. So you can go now, Chase. Chase, all, all, all right. All right. All right. That's it. Stop. Sorry. That's the way it stands. You can chase. I am not guilty to the murder in this cell. In the in Young Grove Police. It's because bed. of the ring. What? Because we won't give you the I ring. I am not guilty to the murder if the man down in this And cell. you're saying that because we won't I give you the ring. Kelly's final word on his way out of the room is a retraction. He's taking back his confession and telling the police to go on the chase and just prove it all for themselves. Everything around him, everything about him, is pure chaos. He dumps one of the biggest multiple murder cases ever recorded on Ian Brown's desk. Then he takes it all back and he leaves Brown with nothing but a giant mess to work with. Brown had to follow up all the names and all the leads, as best he could, of course. Not surprisingly, he drew a blank on many of them. Other things could be identified, other cases. But even if they were highly probable, he still had little or no evidence with which to build a case from. That's why Kelly was only tried for killing Boyd in the cells. That one he really couldn't wriggle out of and for the murder of Hector Fisher, because there was enough evidence to connect him to the time and place, and there was a detailed, even if deeply flawed, and later retracted confession to work from. The interview concluded at 5.20 p.m. Kelly returned to the cells, tape switched off. But there was one murder that Kelly was never tried for that really sticks out from all the others because it did have a name, a date, and a place attached to it, one that Kelly was sure about. This was the murder Kelly confessed to in great detail several times, the one he kept coming back to. His very first murder. His friend, Christy Smith, pushed in front of a tube train at Baker Street Station on the night of the coronation, 2nd of June, 1953. That one should have been easy enough to trace, but it wasn't. The police checked registers of accidental or suspicious deaths on the tube that night and found nothing. They checked other days and the weeks around that night and found nothing. They checked hospital records, coroner's records, looking for a Christie or a Christopher Smith. They checked ferry records for passengers traveling to and from Ireland. They checked everything they could think of, but they found Nothing at all. So, did Christy Smith ever even exist? Or was he just a figment of Kieran Kelly's adult imagination? Next time on The Nobody Zone. All you young people, now take my advice. Before crossing the ocean, you'd better think twice. You can't live without love, without love alone The proof's round the west end in the nobody's own But the summer is fine, but the winter's a fridge Wrapped up in old cardboard in the chair of the cross And they'll never go Nobody's Own is written and narrated by Tim Hinman. Storyline and production is by Tim Hinman and Christopher Molson. Original idea, research and recordings are by Robert Mulhern, Ronan Kelly and Liam O'Brien. With production assistance from Sarah Blake, Donal O'Hurley, Tim Desmond, Nicklin Greer and Michael Lawless. The title music is the song Missing You performed by Christy Moore. 
Original music for the series is by Tim Hinman. Graphics marketing and press by John Kilkenny, Laura Beatty, Amy O'Driscoll, Nigel Wheatley, Frederick Neilbo, Jilly McDonough, Ellen Leonard, Bren Murphy and Anna Joyce. Illustrations by Alex Williamson. The Nobody Zone is a collaboration between RTE's documentary on One in Ireland and Third Year Productions in Denmark. If you wish to join the social media conversation around this podcast, please use hashtag the nobody zone or visit rte.ie forward slash the nobody zone. And if you'd like to comment or share any information you might have on the story, we'd love to hear from you. Email us documentaries at rte.ie. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>